Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. Always good to come back home. Testing. Testing, testing. Testing. Testing.
Justin, one, two, Justin, one, two. Justin, Justin, one, two. Justin, one, two. Justin. All right, good morning, everybody. Turn that right. A lot of this. A lot of this. All right, good morning, everybody. We'll be getting started in about two minutes. Uh, just make sure that everyone is aware of the bathrooms or through that door that way and to the right. Please get yourself some coffee, muffins, whatever you like. And also, please be sure to sign in at the front table. 
We've also placed the comment cards on the table. Please fill those out. We'd love to get information from you to make sure we can improve our District 1 monthly meeting. Thank you. try this again. Good morning, District 1! Good morning! All right, that's much better, much better. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we are, we have a jam-packed agenda today. Um, a lot of stuff going on. As I always tell you, I'm just so uh, blessed and pleased and thankful that you all decided to come here at a community meeting on a Saturday morning, and as some folks said, a rainy Saturday morning. Um, you could have been in there. Sunshine and light. That's right. We got up. Right. So I want to. Um, how many of you have been to Calvary Presbyterian before? Raise your hand because we've had a couple of meetings here before. Yeah, yeah. So we want to thank Calvary uh, for allowing us to always uh, open their doors to uh, the community, not just District One, but whoever has a community organization and an event. Uh, so give Calvary Presbyterian a round of applause. And without further ado, I want to bring the interim pastor, uh, Mr. Edwin Fabre. Have him come on up and say a couple words on behalf of the church. Now, some of you may have known uh, Reverend Kevin Johnson, who was a longtime pastor here. He's since retired, uh, enjoying the good life. I see him around the neighborhood a lot. Um, but he's, uh, I think the church is in good hands uh, at this moment. But I think that you're in a search right now for a pastor, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm not going to steal all of that. Uh, I want to bring forward again, give him another round of applause like only D1 can. Uh, they better, because really, they open the door. We don't pay for these buildings. It's hard to find space like this in District 1. So we got it. So we want to bring you again, a pastor, interim pastor, Edwin Fabre. Good morning. Good morning. The first thing I was going to say was stolen, not once, but twice. And that was to tell you where the restrooms were. <laughs> so that's been mentioned twice. So you may see that I have a couple of notes scribbled down. I really don't need notes because when you talk to your family, you usually don't have notes in front of you. But I just wanted to say a few things. First, I want to welcome you. This is Calvary Presbyterian Church in Detroit. Not to be mistaken for the one in Ann Arbor or anywhere else. We've been here for, not at this building, but we've been a congregation for 
150 years. This year marks our 150th year. We don't call ourselves historic, but we've been here for 150. And some of the congregation, when I preach, will tell me, I think you were here when we opened. I wasn't. I wasn't. As Councilman mentioned, Reverend Johnson has retired. Uh, I've never seen him smile as much as when I run into him. Um, after 23 years, but he was very, as many of you may know, he was very community oriented. And so Calvary was always a home that was open to various community groups that remains that way. Uh, we are a community-based, community-interested church. We have a number of different programs here, and I wish you would Come and check us out. One that we're very proud of is our food ministry, where we distribute food boxes once a month on the third Saturday from 10 until noon. Um, you're welcome to be here. The We meet it on Sunday at 1030 so that you can come and see the other side of Calvary if you like. And we're not stealing from any other church. We're simply opening an invitation for those of you who may be looking for a church. I have to have great admiration for Councilman Tate because anybody who invites a preacher to make remarks on the day before Sunday runs a serious, serious risk that he'll get a practice of what he's going to preach about the next day. But I'm not going to keep you. There is a long program. I just want to welcome you again. But before I go, usually when I preach, I end up by asking the congregation to say, Amen, Amen, Amen. I'm not going to do that today, but I am going to ask you to repeat after me the following. Vote. 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 Okay, thank you. so much. Thank you so much. And you heard vote. 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 Uh, you all see that you have in front of you a sample ballot. Now, many times folks say they don't know what, what to vote. How many of you voted already? Raise your hand. Raise, you might have to move because I think I just messed up. Something else. How many voted already? Alright, for those of you who have not, this is an actual sample ballot. You live in the city of Detroit with all of the real information. This is exactly the language that you will find for uh, the three ballot proposals, as well as some folks on here that I never, I didn't even know they were running. <laughs> I, but I voted already. Uh, but this gives you an opportunity to also take this back to your community. And we have some others on the side. Uh, so we want to make sure that people know exactly what they're voting for and who they're voting for. Now, some of you may have seen the emails and the text messages and the other social media messages that indicate that we're going to have both Republican and Democratic gubernatorial candidates here today. Did you get that information? Yeah. All right. So uh, that's very special. The only place you saw that was really at the debates. Unfortunately, we reached out to the Republican candidate for governor to uh, confirm and work out some additional logistical details and they indicated that he will not be joining us today. But, but we do have the other candidates, the Democratic gubernatorial candidate as well as the Democratic senatorial candidate will be here joining us today at the District 1 monthly meeting. And it's not just to showcase them, it's really your opportunity to engage them. They, regardless of what side you're on, Democrat, Republican, you need to ask the questions because once they get in the office, and I know this, once you're there, you're there. And so ask the questions today, point blank, why should I vote for you? And you don't have to do it like that, but the things that are important to you, they need to know these are things that are important to you, okay? So we always start off our meetings. We talk about the various aspects. We have two pieces that are very important to us. You spotlight 
And we got our youth spotlight, Miss Madison, uh, in the back. Uh, give her a round of applause. She's actually, actually, a, she's gonna be selling some stuff here today. Did you see my bracelet? She made it. We also have our Discover D1 business spotlight. And again, another very favorite part of the meeting. Uh, guys, I, I want to make sure. I think I may have moved the projector a bit when I'm doing so. While I'm talking, I know all those hours of hard work. I'm sorry. You can't go mess with that. So we want to bring forward Miss Taryn Soki. Is, is it set up? I didn't hear it up too bad. Just a little bit. I, so before we bring her up, we want to first show you a video about the business that she owns in District 1. Recently moved from one location in District 1 to another location in District 1, which means that she's D1 dedicated. So we can hit the lights and show the video. Hi, welcome to Ego Specialties. My name is Taryn Selkis, President and CEO. What is Ego Specialties? Well, if you've ever used a public washroom and couldn't see the person next to you, you're welcome. Toilet partitions are just one of the many products that we provide for your privacy and peace of mind. Ego Specialties started in 2014 with a brainchild from a business advisor about the booming construction industry in the city of Detroit. We decided to focus on construction specialties because those are things that are in buildings that people don't necessarily think about. We started down on Greenfield right next to the auction block in a 143 square office, um, which included the bathroom, so it was very tiny. And we grew to now a 9,000 square foot facility on Finkel between Hubble and Schaefer. We were very fortunate to find this location and are in the process of getting it revamped because it still looks like the former occupant is here, Value Plus Auto Parts, but they're no longer around. They moved south to Livernoy and Joy, and we are here now. Hi! What other items besides toilet partitions do we supply? Let me show you. So we have framed and frameless mirrors, various sizes of grab bars, toilet paper dispensers, broom and mop holders, coat hooks and robe hooks, different types of soap dispensers, and paper towel dispensers. But roller shades are one of the products we provide. You'll mainly see these in like multi-residential or commercial buildings. We've got fire extinguishers, fire extinguisher cabinets, metal lockers, as well as a high-end plastic locker that we carry. These are mainly seen in like hospitals, police departments, fire departments. So they're on a higher caliber of locker level than the ones that you're usually used to seeing in schools. So we're in one of Eagle's many warehouses. We actually have two that are here on site. Products come into the warehouse and they go right out to the construction job site, or they're actually shipped. Hello. What was that? One more. It's Windows Media Player. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, there we go. Okay. We actually have folks who are streaming. We're streaming live. Oh, hello. Yeah, tell our folks hello. <laughs> we're at home. Hello, hello. So we're streaming live, so we want to make sure that they get an opportunity to hear you. We have Miss Taryn Soltis. And who's your bodyguard here with you? This is my daughter, Isabella, or Bella. She's our tiny CEO. <laughs> tiny CEO. Start them off early. Start them off early. Come on up front. Come on in the middle here. So tell us a little bit about your business. Um, we didn't get a chance to watch the whole video. Apologize for that. We're going to make sure you get a copy of it. Um, but we see that you moved from one location to another location. And um, why did you choose District 1? And tell us a little bit again about what you do and how to uh, interact with the folks here. Well, first off, thank you very much for spotlighting me this month. It means a lot to us. We've been in business going on five years. And as you saw, we started in a 143 square foot facility just down from Habitat in the auction block complex. And when we started our business, the idea was to start a female owned, Detroit based, minority owned headquarter business. I see some of your faces looking at me like minority owned. I'm Native American. So, surprise! Yeah. <laughs> um, although I don't look it, I am part of the Chippewa tribe um, in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, my business partner and husband is Korean, and Bella is our kid. And so I started my business at the same time I decided to start Bella. And it's been a long five years, both in business and dealing with a kindergartner that doesn't listen. And so we decided after, in 2017, we bought out two of our business partners and we decided we needed to really expand to scale our business up and to grow our business. And so we moved from our location down on Greenfield up onto Finkel and we've been very fortunate. Um, I was dedicated to stay within the city of Detroit and to really be headquartered and commit to the community because the community has been good to us. Detroit has been a phenomenal city to visit. I visited it when my father had his own business when I was little and we'd come into the big city to get our materials for his awning and door business. And so it was great to come back to the city and have the opportunity to start my own business and inspire my child to see what women business owners can do. So we do provide products like you saw, toilet partitions, toilet room accessories, lockers, blinds. So when you're using a washroom, and this is more common for ladies than men, and you can't see the person next to you, you'll know where those things came from. Now, if the locks don't work, however, that's not my fault. <laughs> I always want to leave my business card there, and so people call me, right? But then I don't want them to think that I installed it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. But we've been working um, in being a good community partner. We just donated some money over the summer to one of the Detroit public schools that was trying to start up their gymnasium program again. Um, unfortunately, whomever was running the program previously had kind of taken the material away with them. And there was a call that went out on Facebook and said, we really are trying to start this program again. We need some donations. And I thought, well, what is a good way that we can work with helping our community and giving back? So we've been able to do that. And we also take time to meet with other MBE, minority business enterprises, and women business enterprises to talk to them about their business and, and to encourage them to avoid some of the pitfalls that we went through when we first started our business. Um, the person that was my business advisor in the beginning, I am no longer affiliated with that person because they decided that they wanted me to make some bad decisions that didn't go with the culture or the values of our business. We believe in being loyal. We believe in being authentic. We are very honest. Um, I don't have a filter a lot of the time, so this is probably the most, I want to say unscripted, but sounding professional that I've done in a long time, <laughs> because I just, I speak what needs to be said, and so I'm here to be a voice for women business owners, here to be a voice for the city of Detroit, and just to let people know what a great opportunity, as you all know, that this city and this district have, holds for us. Yes, we do. Yep, she had asked the items that I was showing on the video before if we were actually selling those items. 
That is my business. Yeah, we don't manufacture them. We distribute them. So we look at blueprints that are in the area for businesses or buildings that are up and coming or doing renovations. And so we take a look and we see, we count out how many things that we need. We put together a quote. If we're lucky, we get the project and then we order those materials. And those are just samples. Um, some of the jobs that we've worked on in the area, we did the Marathon Administration Building um, south of here. We did the Little Caesars Arena, the parking garage, and the outbuilding. So we didn't get the arena proper, which would have been lovely, but that's okay. We were still fortunate to help build that. We are working on the Mike Illich School of Business, and we've done other projects like the David Scott Building. We do some automotive factories. So in hospitals, DMC critical care tower. So a lot of commercial buildings more so than like people's individual homes. Any other questions? We're located on Finkel between Hubble and Schaefer, right where Sam's Drugs Pharmacy is. We're kind of, if you step out my door, you can see that there. That one over there? Are you doing it in Ireland? Our goal is to hire um, later on in 2019. We are located on our uh, bus route, which we're hoping that will enable us to hire from within the community so people don't have to go outside Detroit proper for a livable wage. So we will be hiring later in 2019, looking for people who can read blueprints, have our fluent computer skill wise, and then to be able like construction estimating and administrative assistant is what we would be looking for. I do not. We actually live, um, we started out in Westland when we got married, and we live right on the border of Westland and Livonia. Or Plymouth and Livonia, excuse me. And I know there was one more. Gentleman in the red and black. No, he doesn't have them. Nope. Okay. All right. so, so, so tell us, you know, what's next? I mean, in terms of hiring, I know you talked about that a bit. In terms of community engagement, that's always one of the questions that a lot of people want, you know, or just in the area surrounding where you're located now. You moved from one location, which was really an industrial area, uh, so you didn't really have a lot of neighbors and things around in that. Now you do. Talk to, a little, talk to us a little bit about uh, your community involvement uh, and if there's a way that people here can get involved with you. It would be great for us to be involved um, more within our local community. We are trying to establish some ties with Randolph and try to work with them um, at the Career Tech Center, but also just to be able to find out what's happening um, in our neighborhood. We're trying to, as I said, revamp our buildings, so trying to bring some Project Green Light into our area to just kind of make it safer, because when you look out my door, there isn't a green light for at least three blocks one way and three blocks another way. So just to try to make our neighbors feel safer. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet our next door neighbor at Guardian Angel Services, and he is revamping a strip mall across the street. Um, surprisingly enough, they said that the pastor at the church on the corner would come over and say hi to us, but we haven't seen him yet. So we need to make sure I, I get out and start knocking on some doors that way. There are no further questions. We, oh, I think we have one right here, Ted. Yes. I was just curious how receptive the city is to, you know, your overtures for business. And also, um, you said you're Native American Indian. Mm -hmm. And they, we know of another entrepreneur in the city who's also Native American Indian, I think. And I was curious. Um, no. Okay, so the specific what the question was with being Native American, um, how is the city receiving our business thus far? And then are there any legs up, so to speak, on having being Native American and being a business owner? Um, to be honest, I sit on the Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council, and we have found that representation for Native American business owners with, throughout the state is lacking. 
And so there isn't any preferential treatment right now with what we have um, that says, oh, you're Native American, we're going to give you this contractor. It's just we're, construction is all about price. And so we're kind of going up against the same people that are bidding jobs, and they could be Caucasian, they could be African American. So there hasn't been a leg up as of yet. The city thus far has been very receptive and very welcoming to um, having our business, as you know, with the construction boom. They're not really going to say no. Um, so we've been fortunate in that regard for the city, that the support that we've received. We are Detroit headquarters certified. We are Wayne County certified. We are trying to work on jobs that are in Detroit and using Detroit subcontractors for our labor so that we are putting people to work within our industry. And so we are trying to come, become a stronger voice for Native Americans within Michigan. I am going to be working with a few others and trying to um, move the Native American Engagement Committee through the Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council to try to move that forward but also to see what other outroads that we can do to try to help that community, because we are by far the most underrepresented, I would have to say. Right. So y'all give it up again for Ms. Taryn Stokely and Ms. Bella of Eagle Specialties, LLC. Now again, as I told you, another very, very, very favorite part of the meeting that we have here at District 1 uh, that we host is the Youth Spotlight. And today we have a very special young lady who's uh, joining, joining us. Her name is Miss Madison Abrams. She is the owner of Aesthetic Beads and Essentials. I know, so we have the gubernatorial candidate here. Before we go to Madison, because I want to make sure I know how it is when you're on the campaign trail. And I don't want you to leave. <laughs> so before we do that, Madison, uh, hold off just a little bit, but folks, if you take get a time to go and look at some of Madison's uh, 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 goods back there, but if we can have Miss Gretchen Whitmer, the Democratic <laughs> candidate for Governor of the State of Michigan, please come forward. I know how it is on that trail, so we just thank you for being here. We really appreciate it, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you for showing up this morning. You know, I just came from an event in Macomb County, and I'm thinking, I got in the car at 7 this morning. I thought, who's getting up on this rainy day on a Saturday? I mean, a lot of people are. That's a good thing, right? That's how we change what's happening in this state, by showing up. I had the privilege of hanging out with President Obama yesterday. I miss that man. I am so glad, you know. Usually presidents, when they are done, they, you know, go off and they be quiet and let the next president take over. And I am so glad to see him not observe that and use his voice, because we need him. We need everyone to be a part of this, right? And I confessed to him, I told him, I said, you know, if I get through this primary and this heats up, this race, I was telling my kids this, they're 14 and 16, I said, we might get some real exciting people coming. We might get... Beyonce or President Barack Obama. And they said, you know, their teenagers were like, whatever. And so we were riding to see President Obama last night, and I said, I told you President Obama might come. And so I told him that story when he met my kids. He said, I know you were hoping for Beyonce. <laughs> anyway, you know, this election is not just about bringing in, you know, amazing people into our state to help encourage people to get out the vote. This is about us. This 2018 election is about us right now, but it's also about 2020. It is also about our democracy. It is also about the future in this country. But we got to start right here in Michigan. I remember how I felt the morning after the last presidential election. I was just astounded that the state that I've called home my whole life made a difference and put that guy in the White House. And I knew that's why it was going to be so important that I jump in this race and get organized and get into every community across this state. Not take anyone for granted. That's what we've been doing. We've been working really hard to make sure that we show up, that we are organized, that we are building a coalition. Because this is not just about an election. This is about us setting the agenda and fixing problems in this state. I love the state of Michigan. This is the place people used to come to for opportunity from around the world. Whether you've got in-laws or relatives like I do from down south, Ohio to Alabama, 
to halfway around the world. People came to Michigan. Because in Michigan, organized labor built the middle class. In Michigan, you could get a job that would pay you well enough, you could raise a family and retire with dignity. Once you got here, you knew no matter where you lived, your kids would have a great public school education. You could turn on the water and bathe your kids and give them a glass of water at the dinner table. And you could travel those roads and safely get to your destination and afford the car insurance you were obligated to buy, right? Right. And on all four of those measurements, we're dangerously behind, and that's what this election's all about. My opponent couldn't be, could, he's wrong on every issue that, is a, that makes this a state where we can get ahead. He's wrong. He supports right to work. He supports, um, he went all the way to the Supreme Court fighting against, you know, real civil rights for the LGBT community. He fought affirmative action. He fought oversight of the Great Lakes and drinking water. When the people of Flint needed an attorney general to be on duty, he did not answer the call for two and a half years. Fifteen people tried to get his attention with formal complaints, and he didn't listen until the camera showed up. If he's elected, this state will revert to a 1931 law where choice is criminalized and women don't have access to all of our own health care and our decision making. These are dire, dire circumstances. But the thing that I'm most concerned about right now is what happens to the 680,000 people who got health care through Medicaid expansion, also known as Obamacare, right? 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 So every day there's someone that reminds me what this is all about. I'm working 15 to 18 hour days every single day on this campaign. And every day there's someone who reminds me. You know, I was reading with a couple of children at the Detroit Children's Hospital not long ago. I was invited to come in and read. And I was talking with two boys. One was five and one was 11. Both had their moms there and one had his grandma there as well. These are two little boys, you know, they're getting treatment. They're at the hospital. They're in their, they're in their hospital gowns and one's hooked up to an IV. They got a lot of things on their mind, right? But as soon as we got done reading, the mom of the five-year-old, like all of us moms, was nudging her child to talk to me. And she said, she's running for governor. What do you think she should work on, honey? And he thought for a second. He said, I want everyone to be able to read. And I don't know how many five-year-olds you all get to hang out with, but they don't usually lobby for literacy, right? <laughs> they usually want a later bedtime or more candy. But that's what this child wanted. And I don't know, maybe he saw Betsy the Boss on 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other child, he... He was real serious, and he leaned in, and he said, well, I want everyone to have clean drinking water. All right. And you could see the stress on his face. And his grandma said, tell her where you're from, Corey. And Corey's from Flint. So I turned to the two moms. I said, what do you moms not want me to work on? And they both thought for a second. They both said the same thing, which was, I just need you to fix the damn road. Okay. All right? All right. <laughs> the mom from Flint, I... You know, she was so animated, I knew there was a story. So I said, why, why are the roads your number one issue? And she explained, she's driving from Flint to Detroit to see her son in the hospital. She hit a pothole, and it just devastated the wheel on her car, right? The rims, everything. She had to spend hundreds of dollars to get her car fixed. She had to stay in the car shop that day while it was getting fixed, so she missed time in the hospital with her son. She had to call a friend to help her pay the bill because it was money she didn't just have on a credit card or, a, you know, write a check. Most people can't afford to do that. It's money out of her rent or her child care, grocery bill, whatever. These are the fundamentals that we got to fix in this state. It impacts our lives every single day who the governor is. There are people across the state that are counting on us, and I'm appreciative that you are here, that you're looking at the ballots, and you see how long those are and that we don't have the right to straight ticket voting because the Republicans took us to court. That's why this is so important, the work that we're doing every day for the next 10 days, to turn out the vote, to educate voters. Because electing me and Garland Gilchrist to governor and lieutenant governor, that will make a big difference in lives, but it's not enough. We gotta have an attorney general who's gonna have my back, not right. shoot me in the back. We gotta get That's Dana right. Nessel elected. <laughs> We gotta have a Secretary of State that's gonna level barriers to voting so you can vote at home that's right. regularly after this election. We gotta have a House and a Senate that's not gonna undermine the work that I do, but it's gonna send me the bill to repeal right to work, that is going to pass my budget that prioritizes education, 
with weighted foundation allowances so our kids are getting the education they need. And we gotta make sure we got a fair shot if we go to court, meaning Sam baggins Stoss and Megan Kavanaugh on the other side of the ballot gotta get over the finish line too. So I wanna thank you for being here. I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing. And I want you to know when I win this race, when I go to the governor's office, we all go to the governor's right. office. Thank you. Do you have time for a couple questions here? All right, so I know she's, not, she's on the run. She's on the run. We're having microphone issues, uh, unfortunately. So we've got one in the back. Yes, ma'am, with the hand. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So we are home to 21% of the world's fresh waters in and around our borders. 21% of the Earth's fresh water. We are lousy stewards of it. We have let corporations threaten it, use it, divert it, make money off of it. And yet we got communities that cannot drink their water right now. And I'm not just talking about Flint. We got old infrastructure underneath the ground that is delivering our water. Dozens of communities with lead in their water right now higher than Flint has. And PFAS, which is a contaminant made by 3M, is leaching into our groundwater across the state. It's been found in 15 out of the 83 counties. And let me tell you this, three tablespoons of PFAS in an Olympic swimming pool is poison. So this is the tip of the iceberg. I think it's, we're gonna find that it's much worse. And that's why, as governor, I'm gonna create a department called the Great Lakes and Freshwater. I'm gonna have a drinking water ombudsman at the, at the cabinet level immediately. We're gonna get a handle on what the real threat is out there. There was a report authored by the DEQ six years ago. Neither Bill Schutte nor Rick Snyder took action about PFAS. They found it six years ago. People have been drinking this for six years and we're just finding out about it. So Nestle is one piece of, that, of the problem that we have when it comes to water. They're paying $400 a year to take almost as much water out of the ground as they want to sell it and make a profit off it, and that's wrong, and I'm not going to stand for it. So we're either gonna start charging them, or we're gonna shut it off, and we'll make Michiganders, you know, the beneficiaries of any profit of the diversion of our water. Although I think we gotta just shut down the diversion altogether. Well, that is an easy yes and gives me time for one more question. Yes, absolutely. You know, the governor appoints the insurance commissioner. We need a consumer protection advocate there. You know, neither this governor or attorney general, who's my opponent, has ever filed a single lawsuit for, on transparency or fraud or price gouging or discrimination. We need an insurance commissioner that is actually a consumer protection advocate. That's one thing I can do. Another, Dana Nessel. We got to get her over the finish line because if I've got Tom Leonard undermining the work that I need to do on behalf of consumers in this state, it's gonna be a heck of a lot harder to give people relief, which we deserve. And I need a legislature that work with me so that we hold the insurance industry accountable and level the playing field for people in this state and bring down rates once and for all. I'm not signing anything in the law that doesn't actually bring rates down for people. I'm tired of phony solutions, temporary solutions that have sunsets after a couple of years. We need real relief in this state and I'm determined to make sure I use every level lever of power to get you so. Keep everyone is sick. Right. Ma'am, they're trying to get me out of here, but I'm gonna answer your question and then I'm gonna run out of here. You gotta be quick, Miss Hardy. Okay, I'm Bob Hardy. Greenfield, and our precinct delegate 359. And my concern, not just mine, we the people, our concern is just what he said. Car insurance, red line. The people are very angry about it, so am I. I hear it everywhere I go, and I agree I with you, and that's why 
That's why when I talk about discrimination, that's what I'm talking about. We gotta get rid of the insurance industry's ability to redline and decide rates based on non-driving factors. You should not be penalized and charged more because of your credit rating or your education level, your marital status. So that's a part of the solution too. I wanna thank you for the work that you're gonna do. 10 days, we got 10 days. All right. We've got, we've got a field office on Livernoy and Seven Mile. Our headquarters is in the New Center area. We've got offices all across the city. Um, we're working with Warren Evans. We're working with Mike Duggan. We're working with everybody. But the grassroots is where it gets done. It's not about high-ranking people endorsements. It's about the grassroots. It's about the doors and the phones and the work that you're doing every single day. So I want to thank you on my behalf and everyone on this ticket. I need you. When we win, we all win. Thank you. Candidate for Governor, De Democratic candidate, Gretchen Whitmer, ladies and gentlemen, give another B1 round of applause. All right. So this is, this is what this is about. You know, we've come together because it's important to reach out and touch and ask those questions. And don't just take this short period of time here. She gave you information on how to reach out to her as well, okay? So, back to where we were before. We talked about the... A youth spotlight, D1 Youth Spotlight. Now you look behind you back there, Miss Madison Abrams. Y'all say hey, Madison. Hey, Madison. Good morning. Madison, instead of you standing back there, come on up front, if you will, ma'am. So we'll give you a little information about Miss Madison Abrams. Tell you why she's our D1 Youth Spotlight for the month of October. Ms. Abrams is the owner of Aesthetics, Aesthetic Beads and Essential. She's 15 years old. She's a homeschool student, yeah. She lives in District 1 on Plainview. I ain't gonna tell y'all where. <laughs> Madison is a dynamic young woman who aspires uh, to be an entrepreneur, but as you see here, a musician as well. She's gonna play a little something for you. Uh, she's currently pursuing both goals and also plays the cello. Uh, for the DSO Youth Symph Symphony and is growing her business and attending pop-ups and community events. Uh, she was motivated to start her business because of the lack of products that suited her hair grade and skin. Uh, so you're gonna play a little something for us and you wanna talk about your business first. Hey, you're gonna talk about the business first. That's what I'm talking about. The stuff that pays the bills. How's everybody doing today? We're good, all right. It's like kind of like the weather right now is kind of gloomy, but I feel a lot of like positive energy in here right now. I would like to tell you a little bit about my business and a little bit about myself. I am the founder and CEO of Aesthetic Beats and Essentials, and it's a nature-inspired, eco-friendly company that makes bracelets, products, and creams for people who are kind of like me. And just like most of the products that I've been using and stuff like that, especially over the years, haven't exactly been working for me because they weren't exactly invented for me. They might have been experimented on people like me, but they weren't working for people like me. And by that I mean people who have Afro hair. The products that I make are made with organic ingredients. They're also most of vegan products. And even though my family, we're not exactly vegan, <laughs> we try to have like all the organic essentials and we try to have everything go back to the earth. The bracelets that I make over there are made with things like amber, glass, wood, rock, ceramic. They're made with just like the things that you would find like if you were going on a nap, on like on a hike or something like that. The reason why I want to start this business, like one of the other reasons, because my brothers had severe food allergies and like they had eczema and rashes, and for like 10 years we've been using only the products that we've made, and then now we decided like you know what we should try to like share this with everybody else. So that everybody doesn't have to keep going to the doctor's office after prescription after prescription. Why can't we just use something organic? And why can't we use something that actually works for people? So if you guys would stop by on the table, like afterwards, even if you don't want to purchase anything, sample a product, get a business card, and just thank you for letting me use a couple minutes of your time. Well, we're not done. <laughs> So let me tell you a little story about, so she came to one of our D1 meetings a couple of months back and it was right before my anniversary. Uh, 16 years, married to the most wonderful woman in the world uh, and I needed, I needed a gift. So I, I went out and I purchased one of her beads, uh, 
uh, uh, bracelets, and my wife loves it, so I had to get one of my own as well. So, and the key thing is, I purchased. I didn't say I'm counseling and take. Can I have it? It was a purchase. So we need to make sure we sow seed into these young folks, and don't just take it for granted just because they're young and they need and looking for your support. So, uh, you can you gonna play a little something for us today? All right. So I think that mic is not working. It is working. Now. That's what's working. Okay. All right. So we're going to give you this one. And mom, you know, she doesn't get here by herself. So uh, we want to also, yeah, there you go. We just missed the photo. Take that, do that one more time. There you go. Come on with the photo, man. <laughs> And mom is Kena Abrams, and dad is Timothy Abrams, who's actually a firefighter for the city of Detroit. So, mom, tell us a little bit about your special guest. Oh, Madison, one thing I will say is that it's a good characteristic of her, and I'm not saying that because I'm her mom. I'm not saying that because I'm her mom, but one of the special characteristics that she does share is that she is a giver. She's a giver, and she has a servant-like heart. Everywhere she goes, even when we did not live in the city, you know, and then when we came here, it was a little bit of culture shock for her uh, the first year. But when I told her we were going to look for another home and move, she said, where are we going? I said, we're just going to move. And she said, we're not going to leave the city that I love. You know, so, and she does a lot of things in the community, not just because, you know, I'm trying to push her to do things and make her forget that she should be trying to date or anything like that, but she, she does a lot in the community. She just got her lifeguarding certificate, so she's a lifeguard, and she got her training at Adam Bustle Center in Detroit, you know, she, and she paid it for it. She said, I want to be a lifeguard. I don't want to be a U.S. Olympic swimmer. I want to give back to the community, so she helps give swim lessons, and she just, she gives, she's a giver. And you know, even with her business, I say, you want your business to grow, you want to be able to afford your your musical career. So you need to, you know, learn how to do marketing. So she is open and she's open to, you know, instruction, she's open to more training and, you know, and I love her because she's a little bit taller than me. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so you gonna play something for us today. Do you need some assistance at all to? Madison Abram plays the drum.
So I just kind of just did everything as I just came today. Because I actually had a song, and I was actually going to sing a song for you guys. But I, um, unfortunately, I have four little uh, younger siblings who decided, you know what, we're going to steal Madison's capo today. We're going <laughs> to steal this and all her guitar picks and stuff like that. So I had something else I wanted to put for you guys. So I just did kind of like an improv thing right now. Just started like just playing the first thing I, I heard in my head. First of all, good morning. Um, I thought you were killing with a Fender Stratocaster, yeah, yeah. one that Jimi Hendrix yeah, played. Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard of Jimi? Go on YouTube. Right, yeah. Jimi, Jimi was good, but do you do you play by ear or do you? Yes. Oh, okay. Very. Don't let nobody try and teach you how to play music because it's a, it's very difficult. My wife does the same thing. She picks, fingers. the brain knows where the fingers want to go. And but um, I heard somebody say the worst thing you can do is somebody that has a natural ability is try and teach them that natural ability. Mm -hmm. And I swim at Adam's Blessing at least three days a week, and uh, hope to see you there soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. um, um, I love doing these things. I just had a couple of questions. I'd love for you to talk about your inspiration. So, like, I love Michelle and Dave Michello. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. I also love Esp Esperanza Spalding. Um, can you talk about some of your inspirations of who you look for for your music, especially as a sense of guitar? Okay, so actually, what I tried to do, like, even though I was listening to, like, I tried to go for more so, um, not exactly classical music, I tried to go for more so blues music or more so, like, so yeah, there was like certain times I would look at songs like Michael Jackson, like a lot of people like um like in the Detroit, Detroit area. But one of the best ways to actually get inspiration is to not listen to other people's music because then you start because like subconsciously you're listening to it, and then what you may not realize is that most artists that you see they're like replicas of each other. And if you want to actually be authentic with your music, sometimes you have to like tune out of what they're doing and trying to be like with yourself, so you actually have fresh and raw inspiration. So what I try to do is actually not listen to a lot of other people. And if I do, it's more so with like, like if I go to jazz band or something like that, then I'm listening to like the other musicians that I'm with then. Like I try not to like listen to other people and try to like, I try to find inspiration with my own self because when the wheels start getting turning, they don't stop. That was not something I wanted him to do. <laughs> but it didn't matter because he was little. And I'm just wondering if this, you know, the same thing happened with you. He would get on, if he heard anything on the radio or whatever, he would take them sick drugs. You hear a lot of drugs, okay, about Christmas. He would play it note for note. Did not forget nothing. Was you like that? That's actually why I started with music, so when my parents were like, wants me. Yeah, I know, but that wasn't what I wanted him to do. Because I had heard, I guess, you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it wasn't what I wanted to do, I ain't gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> I had heard, oh, well, yeah, now he's been in Europe and every place, so he's a professional musician. But the only thing I'm saying is, I thought, I had heard that musicians get to the dope and like that. And I didn't want to be bothered with that. And I don't know what I'm trying to say, but was you that way? I'm kind of So that's why she's still sitting. You see who's right behind you next to her? So because she has someone next to her that's preventing her from going down that pathway, and you already heard me, she's not just a musician. This young lady is a business owner as well, and I ask each and every one of you, please, before you leave here, go by and take a look, and not just look, but purchase some things, because this is how you encourage. It's cool to get hand claps, it's cool to get questions and accolades, but at the end of the day, she's a business owner, and that's how she grows and survives. All right, one last, one last, one last question. Also, I mean, if you want to know any other activities, I did actually attend um, Randolph CTC, like Career Technical Center, 
for um, last year, and I am a certified electrician, so I do actually like do a lot more than. <laughs> I believe so. Yes, you have to take credit cards today. I believe so. Yes, I spelled my name right. Yeah, Miss Madison A runs with a with a award of recognition. You all give it up for Miss Madison A runs. Thank you so, so much. All right. Well, cool. I mean, who is going to step in that, right? So here we go. We have a few initiatives in our office. We want to talk about some of those things that we do here. I know that we have, uh, got you. So we want to talk about, yeah, many times you see me standing up here, you see me making votes here and there, uh, and a lot of the initiatives that we do in the office, you will have me promoting them, but... These, my team, they're the ones who actually make this thing run. Uh, they make me look, okay. <laughs> What's that? You want to talk about Oh, okay. Yeah. The floor is up. All right, so forget everything I just said. Because <laughs> you might hear it again. Yeah, so let's talk about the soaps. No. Okay. For the soaps. If you want to hear a little bit about that. All the soaps are made for organic products. We have charcoal soap, wine soap, which is actually made with real wine. So that's where um, family business comes in and you have to have mom help you make the wine soap. It's <laughs> not over 21 or something like that. Um, so with the soaps, you, we have also like coconut, charcoal. We use products to help like cleanse the skin and not only, like the soaps wrap lather really well like the bubbles that like, you have like when you like rub it in together. Now, they also are like very smooth. They don't take like the oils out of your skin. They actually help and like with that, because some people do have oilier skin than others, but this actually helps like moisturize, not only cleansing, but moisturize because it gets into the pores, it cleans out, it cleanses, and then also moisturizes at the same time. You can use this for any part of your body. You can also use it for your hair. I don't ever buy shampoo. Like that. Mm -hmm. Now for the charcoal soap, it's really good, especially for um, teenagers, because we happen to like, and especially swimming, so after swimming for like a little bit of like a, I like a while, I guess my chlorine, chlorine and my skin weren't exactly best friends or whatever. So I was using the charcoal soap that my mom actually made. And I also like helped like bake her with it. So like really cute little design from the top. That's really sweet. But what the charcoal side does is it gets it to the pores and it cleanses. And the coconut side, it moisturizes. So you get like a kind of like two-in-one bar. And then we also have oatmeal scrub soaps to get into your pores and like clean out. So like these products actually do work for you. Hmm? So sorry for like cutting you off. No, no. Okay. Got a question about the soap? Do you have fragrance? Unfragrance soap? Yes, the soaps we don't use fragrances. We use essential oils. We don't no fragrances or scents because that stuff can leave you with like rashes. And like also the colors for the soap are natural things like like we said charcoal, wheatgrass. We use things like turmeric, like roots to color the soap. Madison Abrams, y'all. We can support you. So don't apologize for that. Um, again, as I said before, we have a number of initiatives in our office, and we don't really kind of toot the horn very often. We just do work, work, work. And I'm just very thankful to have the team that I have that has the same amount of dedication that I have for you all and the work that we do. Uh, we wanted to give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about some of those things. So first up, Mr. Aaron Hall who loves the microphone <laughs> and brought his own, as you see. Good morning, everyone. Okay, that's more like it. I had to wake you guys up a little bit earlier. But I'm here to talk about one of my favorite initiatives here in our office, and that's the Task Force on Black Delegation. So, oh, 
I like the big one anyway. Thank you. Can you hear guys hear me? So I'm very passionate about the task force on black male engagement. And out of curiosity, anyone in the audience, are you familiar with this initiative? Yeah. Show of hands, please. That's good, that's good, that's good. Well, I take things personally in the sense that I don't really want to work for something unless I can really get behind it emotionally, have a tie to it. For those of you who don't know, and I've been to a lot of your meetings, I have a four-year-old son by the name of Channing. And I'm very passionate about it because here in the city of Detroit, we know that we have challenges, you know what I mean? We see things in the media, and it's no secret that us as black men need to stick together, right? So with that being said, let's talk about the task force on black male engagement. I just hand you click on the way you use all day. There we go. There we go. So we can just read this quickly. The task force on black male engagement was initiated on December 18, 2013, with one vision in mind. And that's to ensure that every black male will be mentally, spiritually, and emotionally accountable leaders of their families and communities. That's powerful, that's powerful. So, we think, you know, how do we get things done? For the past six years, under leadership of Councilman James Tate, we've seen both a growth in the task force, both, you know, exponentially in volunteerism and students reach. With that being said, we have had a total of 850 men since 2015 give up their time to volunteer with the task force on black male engagement. So if you are one of those men who will come out to a school walk and will help with a garden project, please stand up for a second for me, please. Let's give them a round of applause. And if you haven't had an opportunity to come on out, we encourage you to join us because it's an amazing, amazing thing. You have not lived until you see a child get out the car in the morning, sometimes 7.30 in the morning, and they see that long line of men waiting to greet them and give them words of encouragement and high-five them and tell them, hey, those are nice shoes. Hey, I like your hair. And you learn from the teachers. We have a principal here from Coleman A. Young. Raise your hand, Ms. Scott. They'll tell you that that encouragement they receive, it, it, it charges them for the whole week. So can I have two things real quick? Can I have Ms. Scott, please join me up front here. Can I have you, Oliver Cole, please join me up front. Oh, take your time, it's all right. <laughs> so one of the things that we heard when we uh, first started this meeting from the interim pastor of the church here is that, you know, when we're here, we talk amongst family, we don't need a script. So we can go ahead and kind of put this down for a tad bit. And we're gonna talk to people who've seen it firsthand. Oliver, for a few seconds, will you please just tell me a little bit about your experience with the Task Force on Black Male Engagement? You know, why you come on out, things you see, and what makes you get up and come out to every school welcome that we have, okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, for putting, oh, thanks for putting this together. Um, first of all, uh, you asked me why I have uh, two sons of my own. I also a grandfather. I got a, a young grandson. And uh, I had a list, a script. But I'll try to go. I'll try to go from the cup. I ask myself, like like many of us, we see problems and we say, "What can I do? Uh, how can I help? Uh, will it make a difference? These are, can I make a difference? It, it's all personal." Um, so coming out and seeing this gauntlet of black men, usually black men, we have all kinds. I mean, from the deputy, we have the police department there. We have fire captains. We've, I've seen the Deputy Chief Bannon from when he was Commander Bannon, and he's been coming out all the time. Sometimes this is the only time these guys, uh, these children, will interact with a police officer on a friendly level. We have people on their way to work. We have politicians, Council Member Tate, other politicians have come out. Not when they're running for office. Because it's 6.30 in the morning when it's pitch black over there on Finkel. I don't know what that school was. It was pitch black when we got there. You can't tell your, your ranking. Uh, regular folks, retired folks, I'm a professional photographer, but I get up and come out. I'm also president of the Grandma One Improvement Association and also board member to the Grandma and Rosedale Development Corporation. So it comes down to what can you do? How can you help? Will you make a difference? Like, like uh, Aaron has said, these children's faces are the benefit. And we're talking less than one hour of your time in the morning. The benefit is seeing their faces because some of these kids, you can look in their eye and see that they have not had a good night. You can see it. You can feel it. 
But when these guys are high-fiving and slapping them, they, 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 they get a little bit energized, they get a little bit more open. And for a lot of kids, they've never seen a group of black men together without it being a conflict. This is a positive influence. And I think about my first grade teacher can't see me now. Doesn't know the impact that she had on my life in 1956. But here I am now. And this is what I want to see from these kids. I mean, I live to see the end results of their life. But we're making a difference. I really feel that. We're making a difference in these kids' lives. And come on out and join us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. So what I have with me to my left is that I have Principal Melissa Scott, who is the principal of Coleman A. Young Elementary Middle, right? Elementary, I'm sorry, I'm gonna add more kids to your workload. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't need no more babies, no more. But you know, she was one of our largest school welcomes. In fact, we had 88 men come out to greet students on the first day of school. Give a round of applause for that, folks. And Ms. Scott, briefly, I want you to tell us, you know, what was your uh, experience like with the task force, having all those men line the streets of your uh, school and greet your students? How did you take it? How did the parents take it? How did you feel? Uh, during the event? Briefly? <laughs> Seriously? I'm an educator, a principal, a mama, and a strong black woman. Nothing's brief. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that came to mind when Aaron called me is something that happened when I was uh, growing up in church and, and um, the preacher used to say, the world is waiting for Christians. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. And then I went to a, a place, a National Council of Jewish Women, and two was at, uh, in my building, and they said, a, the world makes great changes with just a small group of committed people. And so that brings me, it, 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 the task force um, is, that's exactly what they are. They're a small group of committed people that make big changes in our world. And what they did for my school was just unimaginable. When they came out, I, when I stepped out, I saw so many men out there. And what Aaron doesn't know is that what happens after uh, the, the, uh, the long line of, of men are there and what it does for, for my kids, because they don't forget. Right. They don't forget. And so every year they add, and I'm really mad at the task force. I'm, I'm going to tell you about that in a minute because I'm going to speak the truth at this church right here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but when you walked out, it wasn't just the kids and the parents. It was also the staff and the other community members, the people that were looking out of their windows uh, that live across the street. And you saw all these black men, white men, and I don't know, there was quite a few of, I don't know, there were, it wasn't just all black. So there were, there were just men. We, we won't turn you away if you want. <laughs> so if you're, if, you're, if you're Indian or Asian or white, you can come out too. <laughs> But it made such a difference to our kids and our community and, and our staff. And a lot of times in education, it's a delayed reaction that you look for and that you hear. So after they left, what it did was it committed the men to uh, starting a dance program at my school that is still going on today just because of that day. And so this year, this is my man, this year when I called and said, are you guys coming? And Councilman Tay said, well, we don't come to your school every year. I was like, are there other schools <laughs> besides Tony Young? It was such an amazing moment that we want them back every year. If I could have them every day, I would. It has truly made a difference in not only the kids, but all of us. So I do want to thank them and figure out why they weren't here. <laughs> I'll address that. Thank you. Say it out loud. When you got my back? You guys, give a round of applause for President Scott. Before I conclude, I want to leave you with a few numbers, okay? So I'm going to say 850. 850. That's how many men we've had since 2015. Everybody say 13. 13. That's how many schools we've been to in District 1, okay? And in 2018, we've added two projects to our list of activities we do with the task, or three things, actually. The first thing we do is that we leave behind what we call impact projects. Over at Ludington Magnet Middle School, we actually refurbished and built six new gardens that were on the campus of that school. 
We partner with Advanced Disposal. We also partner with uh, Peace Tree Park, which is a nonprofit in the city of Detroit. And we actually installed a curriculum where those students learn how to grow their own vegetables, learn healthy eating, and things of that nature. So that's a good thing, right? right. The second thing we did, but wait, there's more. And I'm getting this, that's how it feels to get the wrap up saying, okay, I'll leave it one more. I apologize to every other speaker that I have done that to in the room. <laughs> All right, folks, quickly, what we also have done is we had a career day over at Christ the King Elementary School where 55 men came out to greet the students, and some stayed behind, and they actually read to students. They also had a career day, so they say in life, you don't have to be a basketball player or a rapper or a football player. They saw doctors and surgeons and entrepreneurs and things of that nature, folks. So please, 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 come on out. We've also promised to do one other thing. We have the Task Force on Black Male Man of the Month, Black Male Engagement Male of the Month, where we highlight a male every month and let them know their stories. For October, we have a guy by the name of Eddie Kidd who was actually incarcerated, came on out, started his own business, and actually received a $50,000 grant from the city to open up his own storefront store. So hey, we are doing things in the city of Troy, and we need you guys to come out and join us. Get involved. If you have any questions, you can feel free to call our office. Numbers on the bottom of the sheet. I give it out a meeting every time, but it's 313-224-1027. Thank you, everyone, and clap again. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to bring up Councilman Tate. Councilman? No, no, oh, I love it. Okay, cool. So not only is Aaron the, the, the manager, the shepherd over our Task Force on Black Male Engagement initiative, uh, he's also one of the key principals for the Discovery D1 Small Business Initiative. You all know Edwina King as well. Uh, so Edwina's birthday was this past week, and uh, she went on somewhere far, far away. It's probably the weather a lot nicer than where we are today. Uh, but they are the two individuals that manage the Discover D1 Small Business Initiative. And so Aaron, give you a couple more minutes to talk about Discover D1. Thank you so very much. Hi everyone, I'm still Aaron Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you got rid of me. Nope, I do a lot. <laughs> so everyone, 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 take a moment and look at my shirt, look at this logo right here, and everybody say Discover D1. Discover D1. Ah, so how many of you guys are actually familiar with Discover D1? Ah, more hands, more hands. I like the sound of that. We're doing our better job. So, with that being said, Discover D1 is actually an expansion of our original project, which was called D1 Discount Days, which, developed, which was developed in 2014 by Councilman Tate to celebrate the 313th birthday of the city of Detroit. Now, in 2015, the councilman actually received a grant from the Knight Foundation, which helped us actually rebrand the D1 Discount Days into Discover D1. And with that being said, it helped us actually open up our website, discoverd1.com, which kind of helps us say we want you to discover small business here in District 1. So with that being said, since the actual engagement of Discover D1, we've been able to reach close to, uh, I believe it is 600 people at the events that we've hosted. And that comes in several iterations. And with that being said, we, I want to bring up uh, Ms. Tina Castleberry from the Garden Bar. So, thank you. Give it up for it. Give it up for it. So, one of the things that we love to do is have cash flashes. And here in District 1, you know, we just don't have an event where people go places. We actually have brands. We have events that people want to experience and come out and see again uh, through our cash flash events. Does everyone know what a cash flash is? Yes. All right, we're going to say, what's a cash flash? One, two, three. That is literally the first time someone has ever done that correctly. Everybody else usually goes on two, so good job, folks. <laughs> a cash flash is simple. When we, the community, you guys included, pick a local area district one small business, and we go out and support that business in mass and infuse it with cash. So we don't go and just talk about a business. We go ahead and spend our dollars to support them. You know, a lot of times when we canvass the district for, the district for our directory, we walk past a lot of these small mom and pop stores or local area small businesses of our neighbors and church parishioners and cousins and friends and them who took that leap of faith and opened up a business, okay? We've become so programmed that when we get in our cars and we drive out to Redford and Belleville and downtown and things of that nature, and we have amazing businesses here. So last year in October, we went out, uh, actually this time last year, we went out to the Garden Bug, and I have Tina Castleberry, owner of the Garden Bug, who's so gonna talk about her experience with the cash flash, some of the things she's noticed, and how it really impacted her business. Tina? Hi, thanks for coming out today. I am Tina. I own the Garden Bug on Grand River, six blocks west of the Southfield Freeway. 
So what did Cash Flash do to me? So James Tate and Aaron called me, Tina, we'd like to come, we'd like to support your business. I was very excited. So my buddy here, Kim, she does all my shopping with me and everything. I said, we got this Cash Flash. I'm not sure how big or small it'll be, but we need to show up and show out. So that's what we did. We got our fire pits together, we got our pumpkins out. They hit us at a great time doing our pumpkin straw and mum season. During that time, it was quiet that day. I think we might have sold one pumpkin and maybe two moms. James Tate showed up, Aaron showed up, we had our fire pits going, they brought donuts, cider, we had all of our t-shirts on, uh, and Lena did the door, did the sign-in. Believe it or not, that day I think we had maybe $38 in. When they showed up at, I think, 5, 6 o'clock when they showed up and we ran it until 8 p.m., we probably did close to $800. I think Whoa. it was like seven eighty nine. That's a lot of pumpkin. That's a lot of pumpkin. So when I say, when they say D1, when they show up, they show out, it was well worth our time. We got new residents that came out. We've got old residents that came out. We were glad to see them all. So during that time, I just wanted to say it was well, well worth it, the experience. And for all of those who have never visited us, come out and join us. It doesn't have to be a cash flash, but Christmas trees will be in shortly. And I'd like to see you all. Hold on, Kim. Well, today, our very first person is going to get a gift from the garden bug. And so, could you tell me who the very first person was, please? I think it was me. <laughs> Well, thank you, Tom, for being the first person to come out. And now, the person that's always last never gets anything. So we would like to know, who was the last person to sign in? I think it was me. <laughs> who was the last person to come Officer Son Children. Right here, the last person to come She was the last person. She goes in. And uh, we do do discounts for all churches, all schools, and any uh, nonprofits. We work with them. So we want to say thank you from the Garden Bug. And I do have a $10 off with any $50 purchase. All right, folks, give it up for the Garden Bug. So those flyers will be over there on the table for everyone to get one. Folks, I want to leave you with a tad bit of information. It's pivotal for us to support small business. We think about those millionaires downtown. We often forget about our neighbors in the community. Without our neighborhoods, without our community tax dollars staying in District 1, we're nothing. So please, folks, support small business. And thank you. Right, so we're going to open up the question afterwards. We still have a couple more initiatives. Uh, but before we go there. Thank you, sir. Transition. I'll give you that one. Before we go there, uh, as I told you, we have. Uh, candidates who are here joining us today, and we have our uh, uh, illustrious Senate candidate and actually Senator uh, Debbie Saddle on his here. And we, want to, we want to make sure again uh, that they have an opportunity to engage you with questions uh, as well. She's got a little bit more time than the gubernatorial candidate had, uh, but she's been the Senate. Uh, on the Senate since, elected to Senate since 2000, so that's, that's 18 years of doing work here for the state of Michigan and the citizens of the city of Detroit. So without further ado, Senator Daddy Stabenow, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Great to be in District 1. Councilman Tate, isn't he awesome? Yes. Seriously. What's happening in D1 is amazing. It is absolutely amazing, and it's wonderful to be here. Actually, I was here yesterday. The weather was a little bit nicer yeah. yesterday. Yeah. We were over in Grandmont. Uh, 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 we were over in uh, Grandmont and Roseanne and knocking on doors, and so it was great fun. You know, run, representing the whole state, it's hard for me to you know, spend the time doing the stuff that's most fun, which is being out knocking on doors and talking to folks and songs. It's just such a big state. But um, I'm doing periodically just uh, knocking doors and, and having a chance to connect with folks. And yesterday was 
really a lot of fun to be able to do that. So we also went down the Grand River uh, business uh, corridor and had a chance to check in some barber shops. They wanted to give me a buzz cut, but I said no. <laughs> Wait till after the election before I do anything radical. <laughs> but but it was great. It's, it's always great to be here. Uh, I wanted to share just a little bit, and I we want to throw it up into questions. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit sort of how I approach my job. You know, I've lived in Michigan my whole life. I feel very lucky because my whole family's still here. My son and daughter and and now little grandbabies. And so um, I see everything through the lens of Michigan and have always, always, when I was in the state legislature as well as U.S. House and now Senate, been a strong supporter of Detroit. And when I came into the Senate looking at what we were doing nationally and how it should be happening here, what we should be doing here, one of the first things that I found, and I do a lot of work on health care, very passionate about health care, proud to have helped lead the effort working with President Obama to expand Medicaid, which resulted in Healthy Michigan. And very, by the way, I feel like we have the one-two punch because if it wasn't for Gretchen Whitmer being willing to work with our governor, we would not have gotten Healthy Michigan in Michigan. We wouldn't have gotten it, we just wouldn't have gotten it, you know? Um, and so, and by the way, just as an aside, um, you know, she showed the kind of leadership that we didn't see coming from Republicans with President Obama because every time we proposed something, President Obama proposed something, Mitch McConnell and the Republicans stepped back and didn't want to do anything to get it done if somehow it would help President Obama, even if it would help millions of people. You know. And so they made the choice every day to play politics with health care and education and jobs and everything. And when Gretchen had the chance to work with a Republican governor or step back, she leaned in. And that's the kind of leadership we need. Somebody that's gonna work with whoever that it takes. So on the healthcare front, one of the things I found out when I came into the Senate, we had fewer health centers than other major cities. I was talking to folks in Chicago, they had way more what's called federally qualified health centers than we did. And I was like, what's up with this? So I went to the health folks nationally and I'm like, you know, giving them hell, and I said, wait a minute, we don't get enough applications from Detroit. So I said, okay, this is 2001. So I went to work, Brightmore was the first one that we got. We now have a health center uh, here, as you know, we've had for a long time now. And we have 10 across the city as a result of that effort to be able to get communities to apply and to be able to bring this in. And we need to continue to do more. The second piece that I'm now working on, which is a bipartisan effort, is to do the same for mental health and addiction. Because this is incredibly important. Right now in our, our health system, we treat healthcare above the neck differently than healthcare below the neck. And what do I mean by that? Mental health and addiction services are funded mainly through grants. You walk into Brightmore, the doctor is paid fully for their service. The nurse is paid. The, the professionals are paid. If it was, for, if it was the, a psychologist or a social worker or a, a psychiatrist, they would not get fully paid if it was mental health and addiction. So I'm leading an effort called the Excellence in Mental Health Act, and we have passed these new quality standards, and now we have to get the funding for it. And so this is, we're just beginning, we're just beginning. Uh, and we, we, I've been able to bring in $27 million. We announced two weeks ago for some individual clinics who applied, and some around Detroit, not in Detroit. My goal is we gotta have folks applying in Detroit. I'm working with Wayne County Community College, or Wayne County uh, Community Mental Health to be able to get this funding. Because as you know, even though in DC they think healthcare is political, it is not. It is personal. It is personal. So I'm deeply um, uh, involved in that. The other piece, I just mentioned two other things, because there's a lot of things I'm involved in. Um, second piece is the mayor had come to me about two years ago now and said, they were just about out of any funds to do uh, blight removal and to rebuild neighborhoods. And he was pretty panicked, frankly. And this was under, thank goodness, the Obama administration. 
but we sat down to look at how we could bring in federal dollars when there was no support for it in the Republican-controlled Congress. So we worked out a strategy and found some funding that was going to essentially end, some extra dollars in the count that was going to end, and went to work to transfer that over, which sounds easy. It was a very big fight. It was a very, very big fight. But we were able to do that, and as a result of that, we now have brought in, um, Detroit's gotten most of it, but also Pontiac, Flint, Saginaw, Lansing, Benton Harbor, other communities, uh, but $260 million for Michigan, most of that in Detroit, that is allowing us to continue to rebuild neighborhoods. Because we know that it's not about downtowns. Great downtowns doing well, that is not what this is about. This is about every neighborhood being safe with and, and ha people having what they need in the neighborhood, jobs in the neighborhood, and health care, and schools, and so on. And so that was, because of that now, we're, I think the dollars at least go through 2019 uh, to be able to keep this going, which is very, very important. And let me finally just say that back in 2011, I uh, was... We were, in, the Democrats were in, in the majority in the Senate, and I was able to chair the Agriculture Committee, Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. And at the time, we were just starting to see things come together in Detroit. We were just starting to see, you know, the pieces maybe, like this. And so I was trying to figure out what could I do from the Rural Economic Development Committee for Detroit. This is a bill written every five years. And so I looked at Eastern Market because the Farm Bill funds farmers markets. And we have the largest, the continuously serving farmers market in the country, an Eastern Market. Yeah. And we have the best urban agriculture leadership in the country. I was going around the world writing this Farm Bill talking to folks in other cities and so on, as well as Detroit, but other places. And they kept saying to me, why are you talking to us? All the people that know what they're doing are in Detroit. So I said, well, great. I, I, I don't have to talk to anybody in any place else. And so we started really doubling down on how could we help from a food, nutrition, and jobs standpoint in Detroit. And so um, not, it's not only about Eastern Market, we now have a community kitchen, as you know, and it's, it's overflowing. We need a second one, where if you make a product and you don't have the money, like most, most of us, that, to do a $100,000 commercial kitchen in your house so you can get licensed to sell at a grocery store or at a, at a restaurant, you can, t you can rent time at the community kitchen and be able to put together your product. So people are doing that now, as you know, as well as selling on Saturday. And now we've got things open on Sunday. And we're seeing folks that are now being able to then step out into their own storefront. And we're seeing it in neighborhoods all over District 1. I've visited many places in District 1. And one of the folks that I always think about is Sweet Potato Sensations, because, you know, you know by the way, she's, she's got good stuff there, you guys. I mean, man, this is good food. This is really good food. And so she started out, but this is an example of how we, in the food area, she started out with pop-ups, then she went to Eastern Market, now she's got her own place. And they have other places, and we see all kinds of other food opportunities. So I've been looking at how do we leverage what we have and from where I am, in the places that I'm in, how can I redirect that for Detroit? Now, we've been able to do a number of other things. I urge them to be able to apply for a transportation grant so that the grends are cut, which used to have just a whole lot of garbage going on over there and not much, you know, the, the, the uh, railroad that was shut down, the tracks. We were able to get that paved, and we have an urban uh, uh, parkway now and you can use it for bikes and so on. And so I've been trying to leverage all the ways in which we can leverage this as an economic engine for us. And so that's how I view where I sit on every committee. And there's so many other um, food, tramp, uh, tree plantings. 
people don't realize U.S. Department of Agriculture, we fund greening of Detroit, a lot of the trees being planted, something we were able, I was able to bring in the funding for, uh, even though it's through a Rural Economic Development Committee. Don't tell them I'm doing this, by the way. <laughs> we started an urban tree program in the Farm Bill. And so I've been looking for ways. How do we, how do we take where I am, where I can help be able to support uh, an awesome, awesome city. And the final thing that I will just mention, because there's, uh, there's lots of them, the committee also oversees all of our food programs. And when I first got started in the position of chairing the committee, we were looking at children, the majority of children in Detroit schools who qualified for the free lunch program, but not all. And there was paperwork that parents had to go through every month uh, to be able to figure out whether or not they're gonna qualify, even though the majority of the children did qualify. I was able to get the rules changed so that if the majority of children in a school district, in this case, 90% of the children in the school district, uh, qualify, then we just give food to all the children. No paperwork, no, we just, the, all of the children in the school now get free lunch, snack, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack. And have expanded it to summer meals. We're feeding over 40,000 meals in the summer now uh, in Detroit for children that eat healthy at school, but they're not able to eat healthy in the summer. And so that's to say I'm doing everything that I can to leverage where I am to support this great city and most importantly, the communities and the people involved. When I think about the fact that in D1 alone, there's some 65 black clubs and community organizations. The strength, Councilman, as you know, is in people. If the strength is in people who are committed and organized and never get up, never give up. And that's what keeps me going. And I will finally say this. The President of the United States tweeted about me, Councilman, a couple of weeks ago, tweeted by name for the first time, tweeted, tweeted about me. He did not yet give me a name. So, <laughs> I think that's coming. I think that's coming. So, but he tweeted and he tapped me because I am standing up to the Republicans who passed a farm bill that cuts food assistance. Cut snap. Wants to take away that provision I just said about all children in schools. And so I just want you to know, I've never liked bullies. They don't scare me. He can tweet about me as much as he wants and call me any names that he wants. I'm going to stand up for our children and for people who need help. I'm going to stop. Yes, sir, so. we want to thank you. We want to ask you some questions. Yes. Now. I don't even know you had a little time. Yes, 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 yes. That's why you're here. And by the way, Terry Campbell is here, who's my Detroit regional manager. She's been to many of your events, many, many. Corey Hall's doing all my politics here on the campaign side of things. So that's it. Good morning. Uh, Good thanks morning. for being here because I know you've got a busy schedule. My name is Tom Wills. I'm an executive board member of the 14th Congressional District in the Wayne County Democratic Black Caucus. Yeah. And I want to thank you for, I think it was about a couple of years back, where you put your feet in pine trees about this um, money that was to come here, the demolition, and yeah. you took it out. Yes. I thank you for that. Yeah. I wrote mental health for 25 years of the field. And I saw when John Ingram came in office, how he just killed mental health services for people. And I see them around the street and looking in their face. There's no, there's hopelessness in their eyes. And I want to thank you for the initiative that you're going to get started. Absolutely. Well, and let me just stress, let me just stress, John Inger closed all the mental health facilities and built more prisons. Which is exactly the opposite of what we ought to be doing. Yes. How's it going, Senator? Good. So I just wanted to say that, um, I agree with you with, with regards to the mental health first aid uh, or the mental health portion. And so as we know that violence is a big issue in the city of De Detroit, yeah. and we have to attack that issue of violence. If not, we're just leaving the elephant in the room. 
And so the organization in which I work for, we look at violence of uh, public safety through a public health lens. So it is mental health first aid, it is ACES, yes. it is those things. Yes. And I'm saying that we should connect with the people that are on the ground or organizations yes. that are grassroots that are doing this sort of thing if we're going to deal with the issue of mental health. You're absolutely right. Tell me your organization. D-Live. D-Live, okay, great. Yes, thank you. Um, Mental Health First Aid is a grant program that I helped um, author, co-sponsor, that we want to keep the funding going for, we, and um, as well as ACT and other pieces. There are many pieces of it. And by the way, I want to thank all of those in law enforcement that are here with us today on the front lines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Stabenow. You and I yesterday were out in the yes. Grand Mount Road Therapy. And yes, we were. That was fun. <laughs> I must admit, people were surprised and very, 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 very pleased. Because, okay, my question, my comment. <laughs> Alzheimer, yeah, I love your drive to make sure patients and their families are attended to. Okay, what are you doing about yes. that? Yes, let me tell you, thank you for talking about this. You know, Alzheimer's, let me just say, one out of five Medicare dollars is spent on treating Alzheimer's. When we look at sort of for older people, it is the, the largest area of health care need. And um, there's two kinds of things that you know that I'm involved in because Alzheimer's is a family disease. If this has ever happened to your family, I mean, it's, it is, you lose someone over time, and it, be, it becomes something that just, you know, the whole family's involved in. And so I sponsored something called the Hope for Alzheimer's Act that is now allowing doctors to be reimbursed, to be paid for bringing families in with community and health care providers to provide a care plan because the Alzheimer's Association found that prior to this, and this just this is this is on the books, but now we got to get the, the doctors doing it. Um, they did a survey and found out almost 50 percent of the time doctors were not actually diagnosing Alzheimer's, even though they knew there was Alzheimer's. They didn't tell the family because they didn't think there's anything they could do about it, so they wouldn't tell folks. And we know now from research, the earlier you're diagnosed, and there's a lot of great research on. Uh, on medicines, and we will get a cure. We will get a cure. But you need to be diagnosed early so that you have the opportunity to get on those medicines because that's when they're most effective. And so saying to the physician that you not only pay for the doctor visit, but you will be paid for the caregiving plan session means that we're going to get more care sessions, care planning sessions. And so that's in the law now. And we've just got to make sure that when someone's diagnosed, it's not just, I'm so sorry, your mom has Alzheimer's, see you later. It needs to be, okay, the next step we're going to do is bring in community resources and folks and talk about how we can help your family and what to expect and so on. So, so I'm, and now I'm working on the next phase of that. So I'm, I'm working on the fam family caregiver side of it because that's so important while the research is going on. So we have one more question. two more questions. That's it. I know the Senator has to get out of here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I remember, now, I remember you when you was a state representative out of Gibson Land and you helped me out of some things and it was personal. So I know how you are with your constituents and for that I'm so thankful. But you made a statement, I'm not sure and acknowledge my ignorance. He was talking about a medical city in Brightmore. I'm a resident of Brightmore, homeowner of Brightmore, why you know, uh, state representative in that district, and I'm not aware of a medical uh, center there. Do the health center? Closed? Did Brightmore close? The one Terry? Have is closed. It's closed. Wow. Terry, we were just talking about that, and I don't, I don't think so. The one I'm going to think was closed. <laughs> so this is a health center. It's not a hospital. You know what? We will follow up with you. I'm sure that there is a health center, federally qualified community health center. But let us follow up on that, because if there's something we don't know, we'll get right on it. <coughs> yes. All right, that's the last one. Right. Hello, Senator Stabbitt. Uh, my name is Royce King. I have a question. Yes. We have a law here in the state of Michigan. It's called the third grade reading law. 
and uh, part of it is about to go into effect 1920 school year. And what it says is that if a child isn't, if a third grader isn't reading at reading level by the end of their third grade year, that they will be held back. But in Wayne County, the problem is, is that that's upwards of 42% of the kids. And what I'm asking is, is there some type of federal legislation that can be passed so that these state legislatures can't hold kids back based on state testing? Well, I share your concern about this. And by the way, I'm a huge proponent of public schools. And, 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 and charters are fine, but it's got to be accountability. We need safe safe, quality, public schools in every neighborhood if we're going to truly save Detroit's back. That's, that's the way. That is the way. And so I, I wish I could tell you we would be able to override that federally. I don't know. We have to look at that. I, I believe in as much flexibility as possible so teachers can teach and they have the resources that they need. I think the first line of defense, frankly, is with a new governor to go back and see what can be done about that law. I think that's the most direct route. Hopefully we can get some new, you know, state reps and senators uh, uh, around the state that will be able to help our you know, great Detroiters be able to make some changes. We have seen in the last eight years under full Republican control about a 7% cut across the state in, in K-12 education, 15% cut in community colleges and universities, which directly relates to tuition going up. I mean, we are, and we are not doing nearly enough on job training and skill training. I'm so glad we've got Randolph now in the city and have been very supportive of that. There's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but th what has been done are punitive laws. You know, take away the funding. You know, Betsy DeVos at the national level wants to try to take $20 billion out of public education and move it over into for-profit private school funding, like what she and her family does. Now, the Democrats in the Senate, had, we had enough of us that we could stop that, but that's what she wanted to do. And, um, and she now wants to take the money that goes to teachers for things like books and paper and computers and all the school supplies and move it over into uh, arming teachers with guns. Now, I want to arm teachers with computers, books, paper, whatever they need. That's what I want. That's what I want to arm them with. So, and by the way, I just can't, I just can't not leave you without saying, my opponent thinks Betsy DeVos is doing a very, very good job. <laughs> <laughs> and she is not. She is not. She is not. So she is, you know, that's who's funding my opponent, and that's okay. That's okay, because she is single-handedly, with her philosophy and her money, undercut public schools in Michigan. Yes. WStano.com is where you can go. Also, we've got our Twitter handle, just at Stabenow. You can follow me. You can follow me. At, well, I've got two different websites. One is Senator Debbie Stabenow, official side, Debbie Stabenow. We've got two Facebook pages. Just check it out. Facebook and Twitter and the website. And Terry's right here, our office. Uh, uh, is right here in Detroit. She's here 24-7. It feels like, right? <laughs> well, she actually does because she lives, right? <laughs> yeah, so. But, um, so you can reach us, you know, phone, email, Twitter, Facebook, Are you all that. Down on the boulevard field, your office, you had one there. We, we're not there. We are actually um, downtown now because we're covering sort of everybody. Yeah. Talk to yes, yes. Terry and, and, and Corey's doing a lot of great political work, and, you know, okay. and so, um, you know, and, and I'm going to leave just on and voting. I know you know this. I know, we, I know everybody here very focused and very astute, but November 6th is incredibly important for all of us. November 6th. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we, she talk, we've been talking about vote, 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 vote the entire meeting. Uh, in 2016, the voters went to the polls 
and voted on community benefits ordinance. How many of you recall that? Okay, some of you do, some of you don't. So we're now at the point that whatever was in place in 2016 that the voters voted upon had to stay in place for at least a year. So that year has passed now, clearly. So now there's talk amongst city council members and amongst a number of individuals from the community who want to see that law amended, changed. There's some things that are on the table right now, and we're going to talk a little bit about that before we go back into our initiatives. Uh, Bill Hickey, if you can come forward, please. Give Bill Hickey a round of applause. D1 resident. And a member of Equitable Detroit. Bill, if you can talk to us, these are, this is the group that, he represents the group that actually got the initiative uh, began. Started talking about community benefits. Wasn't anyone talking about it before. If you can talk to, a little bit about what your interpretation of community benefits are and how did you and your organization begin down that road and what would you like to see changed and amended in this particular ordinance that's in place now? Well, first of all, thank you to Councilman Tate for having uh, a chance to talk about this this morning. Um, as he mentioned, uh, I am a member of a coalition. It's called Equitable Detroit Coalition. It's a citywide coalition made up of around 32 groups that are in all seven of the council districts in the city. Here in, the, in D1, our group was known as Northwest Neighborhood Community Benefits Consortium. I see some members here, Doug Dillard, uh, uh, Tom, and uh, Donald Williams, and um, we had uh, Alicia Marion, who was here earlier from Java House. She was a member of that, and Cora Thomas from Street Potato Sensations. We had about 12 or 13 community organizations and neighborhoods and churches represented on that group. Our main focus was to talk with Meyer, the store that went in at McNichols and Grand River, and we're still trying to talk with Meyer at this particular time about some, some things that, quite frankly, they don't want to talk to us about. And so that experience and the experience of the other groups around the city led us to the conclusion that because we didn't have any law behind us in terms of talking with big developers, we're not talking mom and pop uh, uh, businesses, but big developers, uh, we needed to push for an ordinance that would give community the, the, uh, the right to speak with developers and to negotiate meaningful community benefits for their neighborhood in which those big developers were coming. And quite frankly then the aim was to address that inequitable situation where you've got mostly white and very wealthy developers coming into the city and plopping down their developments, often at the expense of the majority black residents around that development, many of whom live below the federal poverty line. So there's a real imbalance here. And our, our thought was that an ordinance would help that. So we, we canvassed the neighborhoods, we, we, uh, we got a, 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 a referendum on the ballot, and, uh, uh, and that uh, also caused a counter uh, proposal from one of the city councilors. Um, and so there were two propositions on the ballot, as you may remember, in 2016. Uh, our proposition did not win, but on it, at that election, Detroit became the first city in the United States to have a community benefits ordinance. So that's something, right? Okay. It's not the ordinance that, that, my, uh, that the coalition I am a member of would like to see, but as the councilman Tate just said, now we're at a point of trying to, of having the opportunity to amend that, that ordinance. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what our coalition has seen, because there's been eight or nine developments that have qualified for this ordinance over the course of, uh, since the time that it was passed. And representatives of our coalition have been at every one of the neighborhood advisory committee meetings for those developments, starting with the Pistons training facility up to the Ford Motor Company development at the, uh, at the train station. And here are some of the things that we've seen. And we want to first acknowledge the hard work of those advisory committee members. What we've seen is not in any sense uh, to judge their work at all. They have 
worked under a, a lot of pressure. So what we have seen is that the investment threshold is too high. Right now, the only developments that qualify for this ordinance have to invest $75 million. That only covers uh, the very, very top. The neighborhood advisory committee members are predominantly chosen not by the residents, but by Detroit's planning, development department, and city council. So of the nine members, only two are elected by the residents that surround the development. There is no conflict of interest provision. So some of the members of the Neighborhood Advisory Commission could even have some links with developers. There's insufficient area of notice. Uh, when a development comes in under this ordinance, uh, they're required to, uh, the Planning Development Department is, is required to notify residents within 300 radial feet. Okay, that's just two city blocks. The process is too short and it's too rushed. We've heard this from a number of members of Neighborhood Advisory Committee. They're supposed to have only two meetings in order to digest everything that comes before them. The members of the Neighborhood Advisory Committee are not provided a clear definition of what constitutes real community benefits. The needed documents are not received timely. Negotiations are prohibited so that if you're on a neighborhood advisory committee, you're mostly hearing from the developer. You don't have an opportunity to have any meaningful negotiations with them about what you would like to see in your community. And most important of all, there's no legally binding uh, community benefits uh, um, that come out of community benefits agreement that comes out of the, the current process. And so there's no way to really hold the developer accountable to what community has said we want. Okay? So I'd just like to take a couple of minutes then to, to tell you the kinds of things that our uh, uh, coalition would like to see changed in the ordinance. First, to lower the threshold amount. And some members of city council have already proposed this, lowering it to $50 million. The Neighborhood Advisory Committee members should be predominantly, predominantly elected by the residents. Right now, they have only two out of nine. Isn't that right? We need to expand the notice area to the entire census tract in which this development takes place. We need to add conflict of interest language. Lengthen the timeline to allow authentic negotiation. Some council members are now talking about five, six, seven meetings at least between developer and the neighborhood, going over maybe 10, 11, or 12 weeks. We need to provide the Neighborhood Advisory Committee with examples of legally binding collective uh, community benefit agreements that include things like affordable housing, transit, schools, environmental impacts, jobs, infrastructure, public space, historical preservation, retail development, scholarships for neighborhood youth. Some of these things developers won't discuss, but we need to hold their feet to the fire and we need a good ordinance to do that. The developer must receive neighborhood advisory committee approval for the community benefit report that is submitted by the planning department before council can vote on their requested public investment. And this public investment is huge. For these eight or nine uh, developments so far, there's been approximately a billion dollars in public dollars given to developers for their developments, mostly in downtown and midtown. The result of the CBO process should be a legally binding contractual agreement between the developer and the Neighborhood Advisory Committee with penalties for non-compliance. Time's up, so I'll only say this. Detroit, this is something you read or hear uh, often. Detroit, how many have heard this? Detroit is open for business, all right? That's very true. What Detroit isn't always open for is for the residents that surround those businesses. And that's what we want to have. A Detroit that's open not only for business, but for the residents who have been here, who have stayed the long haul. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Councilman Tate again. And you need to know that these, um, that this ordinance and the, and the uh, process for amendment 
Yeah, just want to talk about that is, part. Yes, is going to reside in Councilman Tate's committee. committee. Okay. All right. Bill Hickey, everyone. <laughs> and I'm just going to walk us through the process. As you indicated, as Bill Hickey indicated, I am the chair of Planning and Economic Development Standing right. Committee, and that is the committee that will be uh, managing the process of the amendments as we move forward. So, DeAndre, if you can walk folks through the, what's next part. Thank you. Good afternoon, District 1. Good afternoon. Um, I'm doing double duty, man, in the camera at the same time, so bear with me for a minute. Um, as Bill Hickey and Councilman Tate did indicate, in 2016, uh, community benefits was on the ballot as proposals A and B. It's actually fitting that we're having this conversation here because the last time I talked about community benefits was in this very room at the O'Hare Park Community Association meeting. Uh, so just to give you a brief update, um, back in 2016, on November 8th, Proposal A, which is the original Community Benefits Agreement Ordinance that was initiated by voters across the city, the result for that election was 45% yes and 54% no. Proposal B, which is the ordinance that is in place today, the results were 53% yes and 46% no. And essentially, what Proposal B does is it requires developers who are investing at least $75 million in a development project in the city, and they're also receiving a uh, $1 million or more in some type of tax incentive, the value of that incentive going to them is at least a $1 million. They're required to go through a community engagement process where they sit down and they meet with a panel of representatives of the neighborhood called the Neighborhood Advisory Council to discuss issues and concerns that are directly related to that development project. There have been uh, eight projects so far that have met that threshold and have gone through the community benefits process. That includes Ford and a number of other large-scale development projects that have gone through the city. Uh, there's actually one that's still going through the process right now. Um, there have been 81 NAC members, Neighborhood Advisory Council members, that have been selected and uh, used through this process. There have been 54 meetings in total of Neighborhood Advisory Councils across the city. I want to direct your attention to your agenda packets. There is a chart that you have. It looks like this. It lays out the differences between what was Proposal A and what was Proposal B. Again, Proposal B is the current law of the land. So I won't go through all of the details about either proposal because you have it in your agenda packets. I'll encourage you to take a look at that um, later on on your own time, but I do want to make sure that you understood that that was there for you. And then there's also a web page that the city has created that is dedicated to tracking the activities of Proposal B. It's actually on the Planning and Development Department's web page. Uh, if you go to their citywide initiatives link, there's a page for Community Benefits Ordinance, and that lays out all of the development projects that have gone through the Community Benefits Ordinance process, the results of those negotiations, the actual Community Benefits Agreements that have been entered into between the city on behalf of the residents and those various developers that have gone through the process. Again, that's on the Planning and Development Department's webpage under Citywide Initiatives, and it's called Community Benefits. But as Councilman said indicated, because a year or more has elapsed since the time of the November 8th, election in 2016, the ordinance is eligible for amendment. And there have been a number of changes that have been proposed by various council members throughout the process. I'll just indicate a few. Bill Hickey uh, alluded to some of them. Uh, so for instance, Council President Pro Tem Mary Sheffield has suggested that the threshold, the investment threshold that triggers a community benefits ordinance process be lowered from $75 million down to $50 million, which would capture some smaller scale development projects in the city. She's also uh, suggested that the Neighborhood Advisory Council meetings um, be mandatory for NAC members to require those who are either elected or appointed to that body to attend those meetings. Uh, Council Member McAllister, for instance, also suggested that the threshold be lowered from $75 million down to $50 million. Uh, Council President Jones is in agreement. She also suggested that the threshold be lowered to $50 million, but she also is suggesting that the actual number of meetings be changed so that there is a requirement that at least six meetings occur between the residents, the Neighborhood Advisory Council, 
and the developer throughout that process to give more time for members of the community to have those discussions with developers about some of the concerns that they see going on in their neighborhoods. Uh, Council Member Castaneda Lopez also suggested that the uh, investment threshold be lowered to $50 million, and she's also suggesting that there be some language inserted into the ordinance that addresses uh, conflicts of interest so that you don't have a situation where members of the Neighborhood Advisory Council are uh, advocating for something that they may have some type of financial interest in. So those are examples of some of the various types of things that are being suggested by council members. Uh, like I said before, the ordinance is eligible for amendment now, and the way the process is gonna work is that a working group has been established with representatives from all of the council members' offices. Staff representation will meet will go through all of these various ideas that have been presented to try and reach some consensus among council offices about which ideas should advance. Uh, those meetings are actually gonna start next week. And then from that, eventually, that process will wind up at the council table where you'll see individual council members taking votes on specific amendments to that ordinance that will be adopted in the long run. All of that is gonna go through Councilman Tate's Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, where it will ultimately be subject to a public hearing and then adopted by the full body. All right, DeAndre Lawson, ladies and gentlemen. He's also the manager of the community of Washington. I wish we had time for Q&A on this. Lighters. 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 Mine was not under community of Genesis, of course. So I, I wish we had an opportunity to go over Q&A, but as you know, we're running way behind this. We have another presentation. Uh, DeAndre, again, is the gentleman who is in my office, who has, uh, who manages that committee. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask him, call him, and Bill, you, you're holding something up? Yeah, did everybody get a copy of uh, the recommendations for amendments? Yeah, we can take some more. If you, if you have more, we'll take them. Uh, I'll have to get some for you. Okay, we'll make sure we have those. For uh, available as well. So, do you have any instructions there uh, that tell what the city council is supposed to do? I was asked that question. Ms. Harvey, I'm sorry. I love you. But I know you do. We're going to talk. We've we got to move forward. So, I would like to now bring forward Mr. Dave Walker. He's going to tell folks about this new, uh, some of you probably already seen, how many heard about the Grand River Streetscape? Okay, so all right, so a couple of folks. Uh, that's the eight million dollar project. One million from the city. I think that's seven million from the state. It's going to completely redevelop Grand River from Southfield Freeway all the way to Berg Road. In addition to the roadway, it's also going to be sidewalks and water infrastructure because there's steep infrastructure as well. So that's going to be a big challenge for those of us who live around that area to go to and fro, but also it's going to be a challenge for the businesses as well. So we've had a number of meetings with business owners along that stretch to make sure they know what's coming, and also we've had meetings with those of you in the community. I saw a lot of hands go up, because we want to make sure you have an opportunity to play a role in what it looks like next as we move forward. So without further ado, um, you're going to give the microphone to Mr. David Walker. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Um, we've got some good news to present to you guys today, and one of the things that's great about this meeting today is you guys have been given a lot of information um, from a lot of great people, this, um, the, a potential governor, um, senator. You guys should really give it up for your Councilman Tate for bringing this to you. I think I work in all the districts on the west um, side and all these different councilmen, and you guys have top-notch um, support and representation from your councilmen. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the fact that we've gone through a planning process with you over the last 14 months. How many people have come to a framework strategy planning meeting over the last 14 months? Raise your hand. Okay, so it's a lot of majority of the room. So as you know, um, since we came through bankruptcy, our initiative was really to kind of build on strength. So we have all these neighborhoods, Livernoy McNichols that incorporates University District and Fitzgerald and Bagley. Palmer and Sherwood. We have neighborhoods like Warrendale and Warren and Franklin and Joy. And we have neighborhoods like Rosedale Park or Greater Sand Hill. So these neighborhoods are what we consider neighborhoods of strength. Our goal was always to come in, bring investment to those people who have stayed and committed to those neighborhoods and help rebuild and strengthen them. 
And so then that's what we're doing. So if you look up here in the right-hand corner, we went through a 14-month strategy to do the Grand River Northwest Plan. Out of that process, we came up with two nodes. We came up with an Old Redford node and a Grand Mount Rosedale node, just as our beginning, as our beginning investment strategies, because we realized that that's where we had our strength, and then that's where we're going to put our investments. Now, if you ever want to see those documents that came out of that 14-month period, that book is on our website, www.detroitmi.gov forward slash Northwest. If you go to that page, there is almost a 110-page document that talks about our 14-month strategy, also talks about the different investments that are going to start to come to this neighborhood because of your voices that we've heard over the last 14 months. So it's not us just doing it, it's all of us doing this together. So what's that mean? Um, so a number of different things that we're going to do is we're going to um, do, um, you know, dedicated entrepreneurs help strengthen small business. You know, your District D1 and what you guys have been doing here is great. We help to enforce and, and help that with a number of different initiatives. We want to make sure that we keep the town centers that you have in Old Redford at Grand River Losser and also at Grand Mount Rosedale at Evergreen and Grand River as really strong um, uh, town centers, traditional main streets. We want to emphasize arts and culture, help build strong um, um, local organizations, and do a number of other different initiatives. So what that means is that we're going to have investments in commercial corridors, we're going to have investments in open space, we're going to have investments in streetscape, and we're going to have investments in single family stabilization. So what you guys are going to see coming through over the next few years is there's a huge investment that's going to happen in Rogel Golf Course. The city now owns that. We bought that. So we're not going to talk about that today. That's an entire and um, different presentation. What we're going to talk about today is commercial corridors. And the reason why we're talking about that today is because we want to make sure that we use all the resources that we have, meaning Councilman Tate's D1, Motor City Match, DEGC, Motor City Restore, to help strengthen the entrepreneurship spirit and the economic development corridor that we know as Grand River. So how we want to do that is we want to make Grand River a safer area for pedestrians, safer area to cross, safer uh, area for all different types of age groups, and we want to just make it much more of a viable corridor to encourage more entrepreneurship and more businesses. So how do we want to do that? We want to make sure that we have safety for access to pedestrians. That means making sure that the sidewalks are of top-notch, top quality. We want to try to get these bicycles or other type of vehicles off the sidewalks. We want to do a traffic calming effect. We want to shorten the crossing distance and make these beautiful crosswalks and different things like that. We want better visibility and we want refuge islands potentially for um, easier crosswalks. So on the image on the left, that's kind of how we transverse Grand River now. And the image on the right is what we'd like to see in the future. Also, what we're trying to do is make it safety for, safer for drivers. In an effort to encourage entrepreneurship on Grand River, we want to make sure that the businesses have the opportunity for people to see that there's businesses there. So we're trying to slow down traffic a little bit, make sure that there's nice, adequate parking, make sure that the storefronts are beautiful so that you can drive down these specific nodes that we've identified, park, get out your car, and shop. And that's what we're going to try to encourage. So um, also we want to establish some safety for bicyclists, and do a number of different things. Just so you guys know, we have one million square feet that we've identified through our a study with the DGC of available dollars that are able to spend in this neighborhood. Also, that includes 136,000 square feet of food and beverage that can actually come into this neighborhood. Those numbers came out the fact that in our study, we identified that $384 million was leaving this community per year going to the suburbs buying goods and services. So we need to keep just even a portion of that here in our neighborhood, especially in District 1, because you've already got a viable corridor. So we're also going to use this corridor to connect to great parts. We've got a wonderful story to tell you about Rogel that we're going to be able to tell you about next year um, as we start to redevelop that. So, And then we're also going to have some more transit improvements. You see the new bus is coming. It's going to become more frequent. There's also some other interesting things that we're thinking about that we're going to tell you over the next few years. And we want to create more public spaces for you guys. So here, right in front of, um, on Evergreen and Grand River, 
We've taken what was once a kind of underutilized space. We're going to create a nice parklet where we can do a farmer's market outside, take it out to the community house once in a while in the summertime, um, do some other different things. So what we heard from businesses during this planning process is that what you guys told us is that commuting and visiting the shops and the restaurants in the neighborhood is very important. You like doing that, you want to do more of it. You also told us that you want outdoor amenities, you want more trees, you want more benches, you want better lighting. You also told us that you want better sidewalks and you want safer crosswalks. And then in addition, in addition to that, you also wanted better signage and bus stops. And so we've also heard that in some um, specific things that we heard from you guys last year is that you wanted some new plantings, some better flowers, um, better um, greening on Grand River, you wanted some bike lanes, and you wanted some better quality bus shelters for Grand River. And you prioritized the intersections for us as well, and you said Losser and Grand River was very important to you, and you also indicated to us that Outer Drive and Greenfield of Grand River was very important to you. So these are all the things that we kind of learned from you guys as we went through this process. So we went through this process for 14 months, we had all this, and so then now we're going to start to design this. And here's where we need your help, is because um, the mayor had a discussion with Governor Snyder. He was able to say, hey, we want you to help fund this initiative that the people of this area have told us. So he um, had a conversation. $7 million is going to be coming from the state. And then we, the city, is going to put in a million. But I'll let you guys know, because of the political climate, because of the voting that we're going to have to do and how important that is, we want to move this process along and get that money spent so it doesn't disappear. And if for some reason um, a certain administration gets into power, we don't know what happens to that $7 million. So we are trying to move, not too quickly because we want to get your input, but you should understand that we are trying to move this a little bit quicker than normal because we're in an election cycle and we don't want money to disappear. And so what that means is that we have this street section, this Grand River Avenue, this is what it looks like now. We're going to want you guys to start to talk to us and talk about uh, what that can be, how we can make it more beautiful, and then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at these two nodes, and then the most important thing is in December, and we haven't got a date yet, but we're going to make sure we send it to the council, and we want you all here, is where we're going to have specific input from you on some of the elements that are going to go. And that's going to be detailed input when it comes to the type of bus shelter, the type of benches, plantings, um, uh, bike lanes, all these types of things where we're going to want your input. We have money now. We want to spend it. We want your input. December is going to be that design input day, so we need you guys there. So I'm done. Thanks, everyone. David Walker, Garden Department now. I will say again, uh, we are way behind schedule. We want to be respectful of your time. David, I know there's a website. Uh, that a link yes. that is for folks who want to see this offline. Yeah, so online. that's the www.detroitmi.gov forward slash northwest. You're going to see the entire plan. We're also going to show this PowerPoint that I just showed, and we're also going to give you updates of when meetings will occur because we want your input there. And we want you to be a force to sit there and tell MDOT because because it's MDOT's money, they're kind of controlling this, but with you guys there, that we're, you're telling MDOT, this is what we want in our neighborhood, so we definitely need you there in December. So we are going hard on these things, all right? So this is the fourth time they've given this presentation this month alone, in October, because we want to make sure, again, you all know what's coming and happening in your neighborhood, in your community, but also have an opportunity to participate. I can't take any Q&A, I see you, Ms. Anime, love you, but uh, we got Ms. David Walker, we'll be here, and we'll be able to answer any questions that you have. Uh, we're gonna move along, don't leave, because we still have Ms. Daniela Borum, who's gonna tell you about one of our very, very, very special initiatives in the office and how we need your help in getting involved. Before we go any further, I'd like to also recognize young lady who's here for uh, my uh, council president, Jones office, y'all give it up, give it up. Any other elected officials in the room? I'm in precinct delegates. 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 I'm in prec
Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. That's what I'm talking about. I know it's been a long meeting. It's hot. It's warm. My blood is pumping. I've been running. I, hopefully, I have not been rude to anyone. But we um, have a lot going on. I've talked to you before. I've come to you before about our gun violence prevention initiative, D1 CAM, which is District 1 Community Accountability Network. Gun violence, I believe we all can agree, is something that is a major issue right now across our city, right? D1 CAN is focusing on District 1. We are looking to target right now our kids ages 11 through 17. We are focusing on, and I'm probably not really going along with the PowerPoint, but I have our mission here. So our mission is to pretty much combat the effects of gun violence by fostering connections via mentorship, dialogue, community accountability, and resources. So we looked at gun violence as something that has a lot of contributing social factors to that, the allure of street life, um, alcohol and other drugs, the lack of mentors, the lack of um, a family structure at home, and there's a, a multitude of things, right? So we looked at that and we decided um, there were a couple of things that we wanted to do. We wanted to connect with our young people, and I told you that we're targeting our kids ages 11 through 17, so that's middle school and high school. Today, we have worked with um, Communication Media Arts High School and Henry Ford High School. Now, those are just two of our four high schools, but again, we wanted to start somewhere, right? So what we did with those two schools, one of our components is our um, team forum. We met with them in June, both separately. We had about 40 kids in each session. Um, and it was really great because we got a chance to kind of introduce ourselves to them, tell them about our own personal experience. They shared their experience and their thoughts on what's really happening. Um, they were very forthcoming. Not a lot of issues about sharing information. As you know, I think our millennials really are all on Facebook and Instagram and they're very open to sharing that information as long as we communicate with them. So that was my biggest lesson. So we're hoping to continue that conversation again with them. We also from there took that information we got and went to our D1 Can Community Forum. And I see a lot of familiar faces. Anyone here that attended the community forum, raise your hand. Okay. Ms. Judy, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> But like I said, there are a lot of people here that came. It was a really great way for us to have a panel. We talked about, um, we wanted to kind of, I guess, debunk or um, remove the myths around gun violence, what that looks like. So we had someone that works in, um, someone who works with trauma patients, a, a surgeon. We had um, some of our other folks from DLive, and they are here too, to talk to you a little bit about their involvement with us. Um, we also had someone that was there that had experienced gun violence, um, maybe committed a crime with gun violence, was a victim of gun violence, as well as a parent um, who, um, who lost a child to gun violence. But it was a good way for us to be able to, again, um, connect with each other. Because I think a lot of times, in terms of our neighbors, just neighbor to neighbor, we don't really know each other, we don't know what's happening. Um, and that's just one way to kind of break down that barrier to then connect with our kids, right? Um, and so another piece that we really have been pushing is our mentorship program because I think, again, our kids need someone to connect to, trusted adults, right? So we've been partnering with VIP Mentorship and I know you all have a flyer as well. And I'm sorry if I'm talking really fast. But you have a flyer as well that will connect you to um, VIP. We are still recruiting. We are still working on getting enough mentors so that we can launch that program. Um, because one of the best things or the worst things you could do is make a connection to a young person, make a commitment, and then break that commitment, correct? Um, and so we don't want to have that as an issue. But there's information on how you can um, get involved with VIP mentoring. Oh, I guess that was my last slide. Good. So. Um, talked about uh, VIP mentoring. Okay, so I'm sorry, I do have my two guests here today and I thank them so much for hanging around. So if y'all could come on and make your way up. We have Calvin Evans from DLive as well as Antoine Green. Give it up for them, y'all, while they come. <laughs> 
So um, it's so interesting. We wanted to talk. I know we had our other initiatives. We had people talk about how um, D, how D1 Can has helped them, but I'll just tell you that they have been a real resource for me in terms of anything that I'm not sure about. Questions? Am I going the right way? Does this make sense? How is this going to come about? So I'm going to let them just talk about our partnership just a little bit. Hello, everyone. My name is Calvin Evans. Um, I'm a violence intervention specialist for D-Live. D-Live is, is an acronym for Detroit Life is Valuable Every Day. We are the first and only hospital uh, violence intervention program in the state of Michigan at the number one hospital for penetrating trauma, which is Sinai Grace Hospital. So with that being said, I can arguably say that um, we have over 110 people that are a part of our initiative. We've been in existence for like almost three years, April the 6th will be three years, and I can arguably say that District 1 is probably the most violent district in Detroit, Michigan. Just via the fact that Sinai Grace, which is in D2, is the number one hospital for penetrating trauma, but most of our trauma come from D1. So um, that being said, we look at violence. Uh, we look at violence as a public health issue as opposed to the criminal justice issue. So we're looking at public safety through uh, public health lens. Um, um, if we, we can talk about all the things that are existing in our community, what we know is that Detroit has been rated as the worst place to live and the second in violence. We are the second most violent city in the country. I go, we are part of the National Hospital Network on Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Program, and we are leading the way as far as work around the issue of violence. The Live is at the forefront of it. So I brought Antoine, who is one of our D Live members here, to like give y'all a different view of what violence or gun a person being a victim of gun violence is all about. We often look at victims as perpetrators and victims are not perpetrators. And so how do we deal with the issue of violence from the lens of not labeling, but uh, from from an asset frame, you know, utilizing it as our teachable moment and Antoine is here to speak kind of on that. How y'all doing? My name is Antoine Green. I joined D Live in about August. I got shot in July. So I recently recovered from a gunshot wound. Um, I joined D-Live because they gave me the statistics of me possibly being shot again. But I tried to explain to them in the beginning that I didn't get shot like playing around in the street. Like I got into an incident and uh, I was in the car and got shot just coming home from the club one night, you know. So I was trying to, uh, and I also, I'm a recording artist by the name of Guapo. I had two uh, videos on Worldstar. So I try to join with D-Live to make an initiative with the youth. I know a lot of people look at like rappers and stuff like that, they're just the bad people, but when they go home and they step out of the studio, they also have kids, their parents and, and people, children as well. So I tried, I've been going to panels and speaking of the youth's perspective, you know, like if you get people to actually buy into what you're saying, they might actually buy into what you're saying. So I've been going around meeting with like my fellow artists, um, trying to get with college students, you know, people that go to like the U of M and state, like, cause I figured that you listen to people that you look up to or the people that you want to be like. So um, I'm trying to start some type of initiative where we can have an event. Like I've never been to a concert before, but I've been on stage. So I'm trying to make it to where like we can have an event where like we connect back with the kids, whether it be we go talk to them at their schools or have an event where everybody can come together and you know, we can give our opinions and get opinions too, because I feel like we don't want to lose the younger generation. I'm 24, but you don't want to use the people, lose the people that's under you because those are the people that's building for the tomorrow. All the changes that we're trying to do for the city honestly are for the people that's under us. So I figure if we can try to make it a connection with them, then we could probably make this a better city. Thank you, Antoine and Calvin. So yeah, I think too, we've also talked a, a quite a bit about connecting with the young people and they've definitely been some, a great partner for us. Um, one more thing I definitely want to tell you, I mentioned that we've been doing community forums. We have another community forum coming up November 14th at the Charles Edison, Charles J. Edison Center, located at 24444 Seven Mile from 6 to 8 p.m. And that's just on the other side of Telegraph on Seven Mile. It's a um, banquet facility. Um, some people are like, I've never seen that before, but it's there. 
So you can always call the office. You can call me directly, 313-224-9258. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about anything you want to get involved, you're not sure how to get involved, you got an idea how to get involved, please, please, please reach out to me. Um, again, 313-224-9258. Um, I think that's it for DLive. I hope that we can see a lot of you there. We will have information, more information forthcoming. We will be bringing the youth voice to that um, community forum because that was a question um, or a lot of conversation out of the last one was that I think it's time to bring the young people together with those in the community, right? So that's, that's what we're planning to do. You had a question? Oh, it's Wednesday, November 14th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Charles Edison Center, located at 24444 Seven Mile Road. Are we doing Q&A? I don't have no, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, I'm like, I don't have time for Q&A, so that's why y'all can call me directly. You can grab me anywhere in this room. I have cards and things for you all if you don't have my information already. Um, so with that, Thank you, thank you again. So as you see, we have a lot going on in our office. So we we'll hear sometimes people say, well, you know, see, Terry, Terry, y'all not doing anything. Well, clearly, these are folks who are not participating in what's going on. Uh, last but not least, we're going to bring Reggie up to talk about the potluck. Now, how many of you have been participating in any of our potlucks over the years? Okay. So you're going to be really quick. He's going to talk about the potluck. Uh, and then we're going to give you some other information. But before we go forward, I want to give a shout out to Ms. Victor Lahr, who is our Board of Review appointee and District 1 resident. She sits there uh, and makes real tough decisions on behalf of you all uh, on a daily basis. So we want to thank you for being here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, how many people have been to the potluck? Can you raise your hands high? Well, we thank you very much. You guys can attest to how much fun it is. There's a lot of work, and to that end, She's coming right now to uh, say we wanted to find out who uh, would like to donate uh, for the potluck. We do uh, accept donations of food items for the potluck. Um, we're asking that you bring a dish that could serve anywhere from 15 to 20 people. Um, you do not have to bring food to a table, but if you do, we will gladly take it and it will be eaten. So um, we're going to hold the potluck on Saturday, December 8th. We don't have flyers with us, but you can take down the date. Saturday, December 8th, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we'll be putting this on Facebook and sending it out via e-blast. And it's going to be at Old Redford Academy Elementary School, which is 22122 West McNichols. Uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Saturday, December 8th. So um, we would like to know if there, are, if there are people here today who would like to um, donate items and if you have an idea in mind what you'd like to donate, we'd appreciate it if you could sign in at the sign-in table and write down those items and names as you're going out. If not, we will be definitely sending information out to you via email and Facebook. And that concludes my announcement. All right, folks, give it up for Reginald and Terry. We had here free food, so we're good, right? <laughs> All right. Before we do anything else, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to give yourselves a round of applause. We have sold a seat to the young lady back there. $275 she was able to raise tonight. So give a round of applause. A round of applause for yourselves. I know we can have some questions on our live feed. Some of you guys had questions as well. How can we buy our products once we leave this meeting? And we have a car on the back table and our telephone number for the folks at home. Mad I'm sorry, Madison can be reached at, I'm sorry, Madison's mother can be reached at 313-758-9057, on Facebook at Aesthetic Beads and Essentials, LLC, and on Instagram for all my hip folks in the audience, it's aesthetic.beads.and.essentials, and last but not least, via email at aestheticbeads1 at yahoo.com. That was a mouthful, folks. There are cards on the back table. We'll be posting this on our Facebook as well. At this time, I want to field announcements. We have five minutes. So we need rapid fire announcements. If you would join me up here to my left, your right, 30 seconds, I will be holding the microphone and we will be brief. So come on. Let's make it. I can do it. I can do it. I have to have on the microphone. You know the microphone. <laughs> we know that. Uh, canvassing for uh, Ireland and. Uh, 
Sita, Cook School today, 2.30 to 6.30 p.m. is going to be there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We got John Sands from Stephanie, Reggie Wick, Mother Darling, and Dana Mason. The Stephanie Sands are there, and the rest of them are all the way out the door. So please pick them up and put them in your yard. Thank you. Thank you. 30 seconds. Good afternoon. I'd like to bring to your attention and to your information. This website is in, not only is it informative, it is entertaining. I waited for the website to come back on, and now it is on. It is awesome. DiscoverD1.com, the only city council comprehensive directory of over 650 small business place courses in the city of Detroit. Thank you. Hi, I'm from Council President Jones' office. We're going to do a turkey giveaway soon, and we're going to begin giving out the flyers next week. If you want a flyer or want to ensure that you're on the distribution list, please call Ms. Linda Wesley at 313-628-2993. And once you get the flyer, you can call the number on the flyer for one of my name is Brian Ferguson, Brian Ferguson, Brian Ferguson. I am running for Wayne County Community College District 5. I stole a store right across over that way. But trustee, please vote for me November the 6th. November the 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Folks, please be sure to pull out your comment cards on the table. It's important that we get the information on you so we can continue to provide you with quality programming and a great meeting. We have one more question, folks, and one more uh, announcement. Uh, I just came from uh, Lexus Training. They are looking for poll workers. They will train next week. So if you know anyone who wants the job as a poll worker, please go to the Department of Thank you. Right, folks, we appreciate you all for coming out today. We will see you uh, in November for the events that are listed on the table. Please make sure to sign in. Travel home safely. Have a good weekend, and we will see you next time.